<laughs> Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Well, guys, Nancy Pelosi is out with a new letter responding to the draft leak of the SCOTUS decision that will overturn Roe versus Wade. And in it, she writes in part, it is urgent and essential that we remain disciplined and focused in sharing with the American people the dangers of the Republican agenda. While Republicans want to punish and control women for exercising their constitutional rights, Democrats believe that a woman's health decisions are her own, and we will fight relentlessly to enshrine Roe versus Wade as the law of the land. At this point, though, Democrats' assurances on Roe are so hollow that even fellow corporate Democrats are blasting them for their inaction. Witness California Governor Gavin Newsom calling out federal elected Democrats and last week tonight host John Oliver doing the same. Over decades, Democrats have failed to act to codify Roe when they had power. And even now, Pelosi and Clyburn are down campaigning for an anti-choice lawmaker over a pro-choice pro one in Texas. But the truth is, guys, if I could choose just one issue that I would want Democrats to actually fight for or one litmus test issue even for the party, codifying Roe is not anywhere close to the top of the list. I want to be honest about that. And I say that as someone who is and has always been pro-choice because the fierce debate over abortion rights, it ultimately masks an incredible hollowness and a deep well of lies from elites on both sides of this debate. The real values that are supposedly at stake in this fight will never be won even with absolute nationwide victory by one side or by the other side. So what do I mean by that? Let me lay this out. Well, think about what abortion rights are meant to represent on the liberal side of the debate. It's supposed to be about freedom, about choice, about autonomy. And there is no doubt whatsoever that the ability to choose when and how you become a mother is an essential component of freedom. But there's no reason to believe that abortion rights alone would provide women with true autonomy of choice when it comes to motherhood. After all, we know that 75% of women seeking abortions are low income, and we know that financial hardship is the number one reason that women seek abortions. Many women in this situation aren't so much exercising their right to choose as they are responding in desperation to the way that their lives have already been constrained by a rigged and exploitative economic system. For many, it's not that they don't want to be a parent. It's that given the way their financial precarity and total lack of support has constrained their lives, they can't fathom how they would pull it off. And it makes sense, actually, that most of these women seeking abortions are already mothers. Because mothers would know the full cost of raising a child. Mothers would also have to weigh not just what bringing that child into the world means for them, but how it will constrain the life choices for the children that they're already raising. Elites built an economic system with wages that are completely stagnant where middle-class jobs were shipped overseas, where the costs and burdens of parenting are placed almost exclusively on the individual. Rather than stand up to the oligarchs who profit off of this system, rather than secure actually meaningful freedom and meaningful choice for women that would allow them to affirmatively select motherhood, it's kind of easier just to give them this out, to keep motherhood as a luxury good for the well-off and give the poor the right to abortion. The only thing worse than this would be to keep the rigged economic system and add on top of that forced birth and forced motherhood as well. Which brings me to the conservative obfuscation on abortion. And here it's important to understand that this momentous religious right victory was secured through the power of an unholy alliance with big business. Christian conservatives allied with elite libertarians to vet and promote judges to the federal bench and ultimately to the Supreme Court. While SCOTUS confirmation hearings were being fought on the grounds of gay marriage and abortion oftentimes, the Federalist Society was also guaranteeing that their judges would reliably expand corporate power. Such was the bargain made with Republican politicians as well. Mitch McConnell is perhaps the most sold-out corporate politician who has ever lived, but family values conservatives have re-elected him and kept him in control of the caucus because he was a reliable partner on ending Roe. All this means that just as the liberal definition of freedom is extremely circumscribed, the conservative definition of family values is equally hollow. Forcing motherhood and family on women who don't have the resources or support to really fulfill the role, that is a bastardized form of family values indeed. But a holistic approach to family values, one with wages high enough that married women who want to be homemakers can do so, well, the oligarchs that the religious right have partnered with have taken that off the table. The communities that support families and help ease the burdens of caregiving, those have been decimated by those same forces. The right is not wrong to feel that the family unit is under assault, but it has nothing to do with gay people and abortion, and everything to do with corporate trade deals and union busting. 
As for the rhetoric about being pro-life, I actually find it kind of dishonest. After all, some of the fiercest opponents to COVID lockdown measures were religious adherents, Orthodox Jews in New York, evangelical Christians in the South. They argued, in essence, that life is a whole lot more than a beating heart. The quality of that life, the ability to live it in accordance with values, traditions, and customs that were central to making that life meaningful, those are also a vital part of being pro-life. Needless to say, forced childbearing is unlikely to result in that kind of life quality either for the mother or for the child. Both the conservative and liberal abortion politics really only work for wealthy women. If you're well off, then your freedom is more or less intact, and restrictive abortion laws might be one of the only real or hypothetical constraints on your freedom. If you're well off and value the traditional conservative version of family, then you've already chosen motherhood, and it's no threat to you in your life to restrict the choices of other women. And also, you might notice that some of the policy choices which would actually provide meaningful freedom and meaningful choice in the liberal conception and meaningful life and family values in the conservative conception, they're actually the same. Abortion, on the other hand, splits the country almost completely down the middle, 50-50. That makes abortion a perfect culture war issue. While we fight proxy wars over freedom, choice, and family values that won't actually secure freedom, choice, or family values, oligarchs keep, oligarchs keep control over the material politics that could actually achieve our goals. Issues where there's broad agreement, places like healthcare, affordable housing, and family sustaining wages, those are kept off the table. Now, none of this is to downplay the impact that the end of Roe will have on plenty of women. There is simply no doubt that some women will die as a result, that poor and working class women will lose yet another measure of autonomy. But if you want to understand why these debates are so fierce, why they are made so central to public discourse, it's because narrow issues like abortion are the only thing left after the oligarchs have eaten all the rest of the debates. It's a chew toy for us to kick around, feel like we have a democracy and that we're fighting for fundamental, critical, essential values like freedom, like family, like choice, when the real rules of the game have already been set. And Zagar, I sort of felt like I needed to lay out mm -hmm. why. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.